All right, we're going to be in Hebrews 13 and verse 10. So let's start off with Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll look at verse 10. The author writes, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat. Paul is saying that as the author of the book of Hebrews, he says that all of us, say believers, have an altar where these people have no right to eat basically partake, basically to gain anything that is sacrificed on the altar. If you know the Old Testament, in the altar, that's where all the food is. That's where all the blessings are in. And the priests were able to eat and enjoy the blessings that were burned on the altar. It was not just the Lord that the altar was blessing. It was also the people who partook on the altar, the priests. So Paul is saying that whoever these people are, they have no right to partake in it, which serve the tabernacle. The people who serve the tabernacle, people who uh, served during the Old Testament, the temple and everything that the Jews had with their sacrifices, those are referring to the priests, obviously, we can tell. So people who are serving, who are working in the tabernacle, the verse is arguing that whoever these people are, they have no right to partake in it. Now, this, all, this we, what you're going to find out, it will be accurately referring to the called out assembly. So we can call here church, okay? Now remember I say quote unquote church because I don't want people to automatically assume only Christian church because remember of the tribulation context, right? Now we'll get back to tribulation context. You notice once I started Hebrews 13, I only focused on a church age context. Now there's a reason for that, but I'll get back to that double application as we continue the verses. For now, let's all think of it as a church age context. So just keep that in mind, I loosely say church. But basically it is a called out assembly. These are the people who have the right to partake in it, who serve in it. Now, it could be in reference more specifically to God's ministers. That could be possible, the leaders of the church. Because remember, the context of the verse that we studied last Hebrew study, he mentioned about, uh, oh, what was it? I forgot what it was too, but uh, remember them that which have the rule over you, who serve you, who minister to you the word of God. So it could be more specifically to them. So it's possible, but it's also possible that it's referring to the church here, the called out assembly. And the reason why is because one is, he says, we, we have an altar. So he's speaking to his audience here, who are obviously not all pastors. So that's the reason why it's inclusive with everybody in the church. The other reason is because of verse 11, 12, and 13, which we're going to, uh, we're going to specifically see and understand later on. We'll expound later on. But it's referring collectively to saved believers who are not part of the lost world system. If you look at 11, 12, 13, that's the impression. You can see that. So these are the people, which is the church, who is outside of the world system that we're going to later see. So nobody has a right to partake in those blessings. That's pretty strong. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. That can also be convicting to us too, because here's the bottom line. Uh, why is it that um, people think that the church... Uh, that the church has to serve them and that they should get a blessing from the church. That's what they come in with the mentality of give me. And that's why there's these mega churches. That's why they have all these special programs and then goodies that they give out. And it's, a cons it's an American business consumerism mentality that is very despicable to me. And a lot of mega church IFB churches are guilty of falling into that. Now, I'm not against giving out candy or having some programs, but they are depending on that like a machine. So it's become more of a machine rather than a spirit-filled movement. 
So that's one thing I do not like. Because of that uh, system and that machine that churches have nowadays built up, people come in expecting that they deserve the blessings, they deserve the food from the churches that is given to them, and these include lost people. When you get that far, you, you, we've lost our common sense. You know what common sense is? You guys don't deserve it. So when you come here, you should be grateful to us, not we should be grateful for you. Thank you for coming to our church. We hope that you will come again, and we beg you to come back. No, they should be begging. See, that's the common sense mentality. Those people should be begging, please allow me to keep coming to this church. Now, that may be something extreme to some of you because this is totally foreign to us, right? We're so used to the mentality of the church serving us, so it's about me. But you have to understand, they have no right to serve you. Let's be, let's be honest here. You and I have no right to have a church over here. All right, so when you get upset about the church God has given to you, well, then you want him to take away the church? You have no right. So look at 1 Corinthians 10. Now, I'm not interpreting that. You know that. You just look at the verse, okay? Yeah, if, if, you, if, you, want to, uh, if you think that I'm, uh, that I'm wrong, then please talk to me after the service. I'm willing to be open. But you know me, I'm very specific in context, word for word. That's what it's showing right here. <laughs> Basically, it's saying this, all right? I don't like it as much as you do, but God is basically telling me, uh, why do you complain about the ministry or the calling that I've given to you, child? You have no right to even pastor this church or preach and teach on the pulpit or take care of these people. You think I like that? <laughs> okay. All right, go to, Lord, why did you call me to the San Francisco Bay Area? You don't want me to call you there? No, no, thank you, God. I love the fruits and nuts here. Yes, Lord, I'm so sorry. Okay, now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The closest um, side passage that can uh, accompany this same idea is this. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, notice in verse 14, the context is idolatry. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. What's going on here? Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Uh, behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. See that? Yeah. So that's matching up with Hebrews 13 here. Yeah. Partaking, basically being a part, eating from God's altar. Now, we can tell what this author, altar is. It's definitely spiritual. So it's not a literal altar here. It's from Hebrews 13. It's pretty obvious. The altar here is referring to a spiritual altar. So basically, <clears throat> the altar is you. That's why the church is important. A lot of people don't realize that. People deny a church, but church is important. Why? Because that's your altar. That's your tabernacle. That's your temple. Basically, all the Old Testament Jews, what they had, that kind of stuff, all of that is spiritualized into our meeting together, into our fellowship, into our ministries that we do. And by the way, even signing a volunteer sheet, you have no idea. That's part of a tabernacle work that you're all doing. That's something, right? Mm -hmm. Altar is basically, the simple translation is that it's a spiritual service that you're giving to God as a church. <clears throat> spiritual service, spiritual work. Now that speaks even louder then. It's not just you have no right to partake in the church. You have no right to do any service or work for the Lord. And you complain about the spiritual works that you're doing for God? Oh, you have no right. That's convicting, right? Pastor, can you move along? Gladly, yeah. 
let's not get under conviction here, okay? <laughs> this brother is right with God, all right? I'm not. I'm going to keep reading the passages. <laughs> Verse 19. <clears throat> what say I then? That the idol, uh, so uh, again, we can tell right here this is all spiritual service as a unified church. How do we know that? Because notice verse 16, to break it down, Catholics will assume that's referring to the Eucharist or the Mass. No, that's baloney actually. Notice right here that the cup and the body, that this is representing what? In verse 17, we are the one bread, we are the one body. So are Catholics eating each other? you know, at, at the Eucharist? Obviously not, you know. So we know this is a spiritual application. It's all a spiritual application as us, the church, all being one body, all being one bread, all being that one drink together. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, verse uh, oh, 3 through 4 is, uh, is a proof text of that. Three through four is the context. See, we all partook in that drink and that meat together, right? That's us when we got saved. The rock was Christ, see? But anyway, so then in verse 19, what say I then? That the idol is anything, <coughs> or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now this verse is giving you a warning right here. It's telling you about the people who have no right to partake on that are basically lost people. You can see that, right? Because he says in verse 20, Gentiles. So this is referring uh, to unsaved people who are not saved Christians. What, how they're living their lives, or the altars that they have, it's a sacrifice to devils. So they have no right, listen, they have no right to partake in our altar. So when you have an ecumenical meeting of you giving an altar to God and these people all bringing their altars, Billy Graham, with Muslims and then these Catholics and all these uh, Buddhists and all this kind of stuff, that is wicked. God does not like that. Period. No, we do not believe in the ecumenical movement. That's actually very wicked because God says that we cannot partake in that. We, we have our own altar. It's supposed to be separated from it. That verse demanded you cannot partake the table of devils and the Lord's table the same time together. So that is very important to understand. Another thing that would uh, debunk the Catholics is if they assume they all love to use 1 Corinthians 10, to prove the Eucharist right here. Well, the problem is this, is that the verse mentioned about the context is fleeing idolatry, right? So how can they say that Paul is saying right here, you know what, we're talking about the Eucharist here, so let's all partake in the Eucharist. And remember, in that Eucharist is that sun wafer, right? That, that idol, that sun god over there, that wafer. Yeah, the, the, the cat, if study the histor historical sources. So when we have that, when we worship Jesus Christ, by the way, avoid idolatry. That's contradictory. Yeah, that's right. That don't make sense. So, all right, now let's uh, go back to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. So obviously that, have, that doesn't make sense. Now let me tell you, <clears throat> in Hebrews 13, 10, he says they have no right. So think about who is they then. So you got to go by context, right? It makes me wonder, so we know those are lost people, but I wonder if it can be even more specific. He, he showed right here, be not, in verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Mm, wow. Makes me wonder this, okay? I can see here this is uh, referring to lost people at verse 10. It's pretty obvious. But I'm wondering if it's possible. So I say possible. So I'm not saying it's so. But it seems to be pretty possible here that Paul, he's pointing out right here that the meats that the people are occupied in, they have no right to partake in their altar. Now, what does that mean? 
Oh, can I give you the best example? People who are getting into online, into deep stuff, doctrine, doctrine, but they don't partake in a local Bible-believing church. If they say, no, I don't want to attend church, verse 10, they have no right to partake in those meats. Wh what right do they have to steal? Listen, all right, now look. Yeah. I care for the people online. Uh, there's a good number of my people here in this church who were from online like you, okay? And some of them are saying amen because they understand, okay? But listen, okay, I have a heart for a lot of you people because... A, you're not being reached out there. That's why I went online. You never heard Bible-believing truth like this, meets like this before. But you have to understand this, okay? Especially if you are searching for truth. Get this now. The meat of the Word of God, the deep stuff, truth, you have no right to partake in it. What makes you think that because I want truth, I should have truth? No, God doesn't. God is not obligated to give you truth even if you want it. Now, I know that's kind of pretty strong, but it is very true because even if he gives you truth, it makes God wonder if you're going to waste away that truth. See that? What, what's the point of you knowing all this deep meat, the meat of the Word of God, if you're not going to use it for him? That's why we emphasize going to a Bible-believing church, please, please, okay? Why? Because you need to utilize the meat, not just keep it in here. Right. Now you need to utilize it for the Lord. And what, did the, and what did the Lord want? He showed you at verse 10, it's an assembly here. We, see that? There's a group meeting right here. It's an assembly. You need to partake with an assembly, a called out assembly that God had. During this time, Paul, he, there was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, so obviously Paul did not meant virtual clicking. He meant literally assembling, meeting together as a group and working together for the Lord. Now that's a definition of a church then. Church literally means called out assembly, where they're all meeting together as a group. So if they, if... There are so many people nowadays, which is very bad. So those of you who are watching us online, don't get caught up, please, by the deception of people bashing local Bible-believing churches. Amen. And I just have online, so I'm fine. No, 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 okay? Right. If you have that mentality, no. Say Dr. Gene Kim says so. You see Berkeley and PBI, da, 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 da. no, 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 okay? Yeah. So here's the thing. The reason why it's a big no is because verse 9 and 10, look, just read that verse. That's where you're all stuck at. You're occupied in the meat. You don't even have any right to eat that meat, to take in the meat if you're not going to use it for God, what he called you to do. See that? Now, look, don't get me wrong. I know there are plenty of people that I know of, okay? that uh, they, can't, they don't have a Bible-believing church near them. So then what we do is that we'll tell them, hey, find the next best church then. Even if it's not a Bible-believing church, find an independent Baptist church that uses a King James Bible. You'd be surprised there's a lot of them out there. And there are people in communist countries, Muslim countries, or in places literally, no, <laughs> no church there. I get that. So that's why we stay over here online and we want to minister as much as we can to help you. But listen, man, I got people driving three and a half hours. I'm not joking, all right? Even on a Wednesday, all right? All right, one of them is actually here, okay? Which is a surprise. On a Wednesday, all right? So if that don't convict people watching us online who says, I can't go because it's an hour drive, I got people majority of people here that's a norm now the majority it's a norm now for us including yours truly if that's hard to believe so we're all doing that you might say wow why are you all doing that it's called the last days when we're under persecution get this when we go underground and there's persecution 
and then the government gets on to everybody, I wonder how hard you're going to work for hours to assemble together in secret and hiding. It ain't going to be a 10-minute walk, I can assure you. Okay, now we go to verse 11. Y'all got a blessing? Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so uh, verse 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Okay, so let me explain each and every word and line here. Uh, obviously, the, the dead carcasses of the beasts, the bodies of the beasts that are offered on the altar sacrifice. Uh, I'm very sorry for those who are watching me online that I'm chewing the candy. I know it's kind of rude, but I have to do it for my throat, okay? But anyway, their blood is being shed in the, sanct uh, in the sanctuary. It's inside the sanctuary. It's inside the tabernacle, obviously. And then the high priest is the one responsible for bringing the blood and the sacrifice of the animals for the sins of the people. But notice a specific note, it's burned without the camp. So in other words, it's, this takes place, this burning of this <clears throat> animal, forgiveness of sins, outside of the camp of Israel. So it's not, uh, it's not within the, civiliz uh, the civilization of the Jews. It's outside of their civilization. The Lord deliberately set that up, the tabernacle, the altar, to be outside, away from them. Why is that? Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. It represented and pictured Jesus Christ matched up very well, where Jesus also was able to sanctify the people take care of their sin problem by his own blood, through his sacrifice, through his suffering, which took place outside the camp. So it was not uh, outside the gate, excuse me. So it was not in the city of Jerusalem, it was outside. But this outside the camp, the author is aiming more specifically at outside of society. That's the idea. Outcast. That's the idea. He's trying to bring that thought to us. We're not part of the world system, outside the world. Now, Jesus Christ... I'm going to give you something here from Dr. Ruckman's uh, uh, commentary, which is very interesting. But it shows how much Jesus Christ loved us. First of all, go to Exodus 29. And keep your hand here, Exodus 29. Now, why did Jesus' sacrifice has to be done in this manner, outside of the gate outside of civilization. Why did the animal sacrifices have to do that? Now think about this. Whenever you read the Bible about somebody being cut off from civilization in the Old Testament, somebody who's cast out of the city, that's not a good thing, right? It's a negative thing. It gives the impression that you're either very wicked sinful or very filthy or uh, unclean. Another thing to think about is, if you know the city of, I think it was Jerusalem, but the nation of Israel, in their city, they have a place where they call Gehenna, and they dump trash outside of the city. So that literally outside the gate, outside the city, it means what it says. That's where all the, the junk is going. By the way, when a person, okay, I don't mean to be disgusting, but this is true, it's scripture, and I'm going to try to keep it as filtered as I can, but if a person has to do his uh, restroom business, got to go to the bathroom, during the times of the nation of Israel, they didn't have a flush where it went, obviously, so they didn't have a plumbing system like that. What they did 
is that they had to go outside the city in private and then dig a hole and bury it there. See that? Basically everything disgusting, vile, filthy, wicked is connected to outside the camp. So what did Jesus do? He represented that. That's something. Exodus 29, 14. Exodus 29, 14. Now look at this. This is the animal sacrifice. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his what? Dung. Shalt thou burn with what? Fire what? Without the camp. It is a sin offering. Ain't that something? Now you're more thankful for what Jesus Christ did? Uh, look at uh, Leviticus 13.46. Leviticus 13.46. You know what Jesus Christ had to associate himself with? Piece of garbage. When people call you that, and there are cuss words for that too, you know, piece of garbage, piece of blankety blank that refers to your dung, you know what? Jesus Christ had to, be, had to associate himself with that when he died on the cross. That's something, ain't it? That's something. Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 46. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. That's leprosy. He shall dwell alone. What? Without the camp shall his habitation be. He has to go outside the camp. That's where sick people go, the lepers. Jesus had to take the leprosy. He had to take everything unclean. Dr. Uckman said, my, my, what a picture. Christ was leprous for the leper. Christ was cast off for the cast off. Christ was forsaken for those whom God should forsake. When Christ became sin for us, he, t he took our curse to the extent of being likened to Satan and as such was rejected of God, he was refuse, cast out of the camp. That's what they did with lepers. Ain't that something? Makes you more thankful for what Jesus Christ did for you. Now, th th returning to the previous context, th th that makes you understand if this is done outside the camp, Jesus Christ did all this so this can be enacted outside the camp, what makes you and I think we have any right to partake in that? That's very convicting, is it not? Well, it, look, if you don't want to serve God, you have a thing called free choice. Don't serve him then. If you don't want to partake in a local Bible-believing church, don't then. You have every free right. You say, uh, you say, I don't want it. Well, you and I don't have any rights anyway. That's something. Do you realize how many people are throwing away a precious gift? That took a lot of, uh, that took a heavy price. But we mourn quite often about our Christian service to him, about the Bible-believing church that we're working under, and that, oh man, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, so hard, you know, to work in a ministry, blah, 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 blah. You and I have no right then. Then we should be out on the streets like all the other San Francisco Bay Area people doing whatever godforsaken thing they're doing out there. That's where we have the right to be. I have the right to do whatever I want, whatever pleases me. You're right. You have the right to do whatever you want. So go out and do it then. Because we have no right to partake in this. Our only right was to live in sin and please our flesh. So go for it then. All right, now let's go back to Hebrews 13. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 13. Make sure, uh, it's th those are good verses, amen? amen. You know, it's pretty funny. Uh, I find it uh, very befitting. Hebrews 13 talked a lot about faith, trusting God, suffering, chastisement, and it's so hard. Well, then he concludes everything with, well, we have no right in this altar then. So if you can't serve God anymore, you can't have enough faith, you can't suffer for him, you can't do whatever for him, well, you have no right anyway. So why be, be a part of it? I think that's befitting to do that at a conclusion. 
All right, so we go to verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, there's a false doctrine called Calvinism. Calvinism teaches as follows. They have five points, which is a flower called tulip, but uh, it's not literally a flower, obviously, but they just put that acronym in there, okay? So I hope some of you didn't get lost on that one, all right? But anyway, um, they have two points in their acronym TULIP. We're not going to go through all five of them, but uh, there is one that uh, there are two that you want to keep in mind. One is called Presser perseverance, not preservation. We, <laughs> I, hope they, they, I hope that they did, you know. <laughs> perseverance of the saints. And then they have another one called irresistible grace. Now these two doctrines, which are false, they teach this. Basically, the reason why you got saved is not because of your free choice, is because God made you get saved which is totally blasphemous, which means then that people who are not saved, who didn't get saved, it was not from their free choice, right? That's very much unfair. That's what it's basically teaching then. That's what it's saying. Calvinists, they try to go around it. I, I'm not going to get into all the theological semantics, okay? But basically, that's what they're saying, even if they don't admit it. So, this irresistible grace, God puts that grace in you. So, he puts you that grace that you cannot resist it, that you cannot help but just receive it and you want to get saved and believe on salvation by grace. So that's what they believe. They also believe if you have this salvation by grace that you will persevere. So there's a false doctrine called lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is one that's promoted by John MacArthur. John MacArthur, he's the one that's kind of in between with the Baptists and then the Calvinists. That's why the Baptists, uh, they get into John MacArthur's stuff. But anyway, lordship, salvation, perseverance of the saints, meaning that if you are really saved by grace, then there should be works out of your life. So there should be a significant amount of sins that you're not doing in your life. That's what they teach. So they believe in eternal security but they believe that within this eternal security, you're going to not sin. You're going to always be uh, living cl clean. Of course, they believe that you can sin here and there, but significantly out of your life, there should be works. That's their idea. Now, I want to challenge this notion. Go to Hebrews 10. So let's say when Jesus sanctified the people, that's only the elect. That's what they'll call them, the elect. They don't believe Jesus died for the whole world. No, that's blasphemy. Jesus died for everybody. He didn't pick a select class of elites that he decided that they'll get saved. He didn't do it that way. He did it for everybody. But they'll assume that sanctify the people is going to be in Hebrews uh, 13, 12, that this is going to be only the elect. So we do actually cover two more things, believe it or not. So that's limited atonement, meaning that his atonement was limited. It was only for a special class of people. And then uh, unconditional election, that's the elect, obviously. So we did get to cover four, actually, believe it or not. Wow, okay. Then let me debunk all four with just two verses, shall I? Okay. If that's their notion, then this is a problem for them. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And then verse 29, same idea as Hebrews 13, no doubt. Remember, Jesus sanctified the people, whoever the people are. Let's assume that's the elect, that the Calvinists say. Sanctify the people with his own blood. Let's assume that's only the elect. Then Hebrews 10, 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was what? You, you see that? Oh, that's a problem. So Jesus sanctified that person, but then the person trod that underfoot. And look at this, and hath done despite unto the what? 
I thought he can't resist that grace if Jesus sanctified that person with his blood. Contradictory. That doesn't make sense, right? So, uh, so these two verses just easily dismantled Calvinism. Now, for a Bible-believing dispensationalist, it's very simple, right? For a Bible-believing dispensationalist, what we know from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, that this is referring to Hebrews in the tribulation, right? In the tribulation time, here are Jews that God wants to concentrate and use again. Because the nation of Israel, as we do know, they've been temporarily cast aside and God used the Christian church. But when the Christian church gets raptured, God, go, God returns to the nation of Israel. He wants to restore them again. So during the tribulation, these Hebrews, these Jews are undergoing a, a time of great wrath, a time of uh, great temptation and tribulation where they have to constantly resist the Antichrist. Once they uh, trust in the blood and receive the blood of Jesus Christ, they have to also do works out of their life and the works are very apparent because they have to resist the mark of the beast. They cannot deny him under persecution. Look, that's a lot of work that you're doing. All right? Well, that, that ain't works. No, it is work. If someone is torturing you and you can't deny Jesus Christ, that's a lot more work than coming to church. And here are people who say, it's so hard to go to church. I have to drive one hour. And they say, I'm willing to die in the tribulation. I'm a truther. What in the world? <laughs> okay, but anyway, it's strange uh, common sense in our world nowadays. So Hebrews 10.29, that's our simple answer. If you're a dispensationalist, Bible-believing dispensationalist, that's a simple answer right there. And obviously that just totally contradicts Calvinism. They have no way of doing it. There's a good number of Calvinists who do not believe in dispensationalism, which is why they won't be able to have this doctrine. MacArthur, he's a little bit dispensationalist because he's a hybrid on a lot of doctrines, but uh, he's not a Bible-believing dispensationalist like us, where we believe in dispensational salvations. If you believe in dispensational salvations, that solves a lot of issues with contradicting salvation plans. So as you've heard from tonight, the tribulation saints when they go under persecution from the Antichrist, it makes sense that their salvation is very different from ours. Their salvation, they have to do a lot of works with faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to do those two things. They have to constantly, as I've taught you at Hebrews 10, wash themselves in the blood of Christ. They have to wash their garments. That's why Revelation chapter 7 says they wash their garments. They themselves are washing their own garments in the blood of Jesus Christ. But you and I, it's never recorded that at all. We don't wash our own garments in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Never has that recorded it. It's only for tribulation saints. Instead, Jesus Christ wash us, washes us in his blood. So that's very different. All right, but anyway, let's go back. To, uh, I, I, I've dumped a whole bunch of dispensational stuff. But if you've been in our Hebrew study from beginning to end, it's just review. But if this is new information, that was a lot of overload. <laughs> if some of you have questions, please feel free to talk to me after church. All right, let's go back here. In verse 13, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his approach. So the author is now telling these saved believers, he's encouraging all of them, all of them, hey, let, let us all get, go to Jesus Christ, follow his example, go forth to him. Let us also follow that outside the camp and bearing his reproach. Wow, that's something. If you know a lot, there's a lot of verses about Jesus Christ bearing our reproaches, right? The reproach of them fell on me, right? There are so many verses on that. So now we're a part of that crucified life where we carry that for him. So Paul is encouraging the audience to do that. Now, there are three applications to keep in mind over here. So again, 
in verse 13, when we also follow that example to go outside the world, when we follow the cross, this is this uh, wicked world. We're supposed to go outside of it. It represents three things when we go uh, outside the camp. You see that? That's called camp. So let me associate that with camp. One is pretty obvious is the world. That's the city and the camp you, can, you and I can think about. So family forsake you, criticize you. And the world says, why aren't you a part of us? There are false churches, apostate churches that are lost people that uh, say, why don't, you join our, why don't you join us? No, we're supposed to go outside the city, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Why are we not part of the National Council of Churches, the ecumenical movement? Why, why is our church not a part of that much? Because we're supposed to be outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And that's true. Now we're a reproach to the Bay Area, aren't we? And now that the world knows us online, pretty much the whole world hates us. <laughs> okay. So we're now a, a reproach to all of them. Why? Because we're supposed to. We're supposed to be outside the camp. A second thing to keep in mind is that now there are these uh, clubs, basically, or camps. You'll hear that quite often amongst uh, independent Baptist churches. They'll talk about different camps. What they mean by different camps is they have their favorite, favorite group or club of preachers. And if you're not a part of them, then you're not of them, they're saying. And if you fellowship with uh, other preachers, independent Baptist church, uh, independent Baptist church pastors that this independent Baptist church pastor doesn't like, then you're of a different camp. So they have so many different camps. They have sort of the Lord camps, PCC camps, Hiles camps, and then Paul Chapel camps, and then blah, blah, blah. There's just so many different camps. Well, uh, this is our answer, 1 Corinthians. It's a standard answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We don't go by people's names and go by certain camps here. We don't do that. We're, we're a camp of Jesus Christ. We're part of Jesus Christ. We're outside the camp. You get into these big IFB meetings. Oh, whose camp? Whose group are you with? And you just say, hey, I'm of Jesus Christ. I'm outside the camp. <laughs> so 1 Corinthians chapter 3. They don't like that. IFB people look down on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, no, verse 3. This is really good. Verse 3. For ye are, yet, uh, ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Why is there divisions? Because everybody has their favorite uh, preacher or group of preachers that they're a part of. They're that club, that camp. Who then is Paul? And who is a, uh, for what, while one saith, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? See, Paul's saying you're carnal when you do that. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So Paul is arguing right here, no one is, a, it's not a camp. It's not a one-man show. We're all in this together as saved people. Now, when you grow more in your Christian walk, you're going to notice these camps. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. There's always splits and splits, even amongst Baptists. Baptists are the most infamous for splits. As Dr. Rutman says, they split into splinters. So they go Northern Baptist, Hardshell Baptist, and then Sovereign Grace Baptist, Free Will Baptist, and then uh, this is on and on and on and goes. Finally, the group that we're a part of is independent Baptist. You might say, why? Because the Baptist wants to be independent. They don't want to be tied to an organization. Yeah. So that is the most biblical route. So we ended up becoming independent Baptists. But now independent Baptists now have their own camps. You know, are you Hiles, sort of the Lord, or are you this and that and that? Oh, you're a Ruckmanite, aren't you? Because you're from that Ruckman church. And so they all do that. <laughs> they all accuse us of that. But we don't care about that, obviously. We just go without the camp. Bearing the reproach. So now we're a scourge around the scourge around the IFB community. They kind of look down on you, you know, if they see that uh, you're not a part of their crowd. 
Now, here's another one I want to warn. So number two, let me mention number two. So now we know what outside the camp is. Outside the camp, meaning your favorite, you know, group of preachers, see? Favorite uh, preacher club or something, you know? <laughs> it's really weird, you know? Now, number three, here's an important one that I want you to hear. It is true that uh, we are without the camp, but then there are those who are rogues. Now, I don't like hearing this, okay? Uh, whenever uh, people, uh, they act prideful, and then they'll go, well, I'm not a part of anybody's church. Or, you know, okay, those pastors that you like, yeah, but I'm, I'm, part, I'm the camp of Jesus Christ. So there are those who actually completely disregard, completely dishonors uh, pastors uh, whom the Lord mightily used. So then there are those type of people. So then, they'll go, uh, so then they'll go, why do you always talk about that pastor who's been a blessing to you? You know, I mean, they think then they're going to accuse you for being number two. And then they act all pious and like, I'm the camp of Jesus Christ. Listen, man, uh, if you look at uh, verse 13, Paul said about uh, going forth outside the camp, right? However, didn't he mention about verse 7? There is a pastor you're supposed to remember and what? Follow. Follow. So, yeah, there are... Uh, Bible-believing preachers who I follow. Some of them may have heard me say that uh, when uh, online. I don't believe in being road. I'm not a Gene Kim man, one-man show. Oh, Jesus and me, you know, I'm following Jesus. Who cares what these other preachers think? That's why a lot of online channels are rogues. Watch out for them, right. all right? Watch out for them, especially if they don't have a local Bible-believing church. Okay, so what they do is it's a one-man show, and there are reasons why local Bible-believing church pastors are avoiding them too. Why? Because they're a one-man show. They like to give this pious thing, you know, that, oh, uh, it's not a matter of people's names or pastors' names. You know, it's all about Jesus. What he's saying is it's about me. I don't like those people. What they're doing is they're justifying the way they live the way they act, because as long as I have Jesus' approval, I'm okay. No, maybe it's because you're a jerk, or there's something shady about you. That's why a lot of Bible-believing pastors are avoiding you. Did that make any sense? All right? If you're a one-man show, let's be honest, you're odd. There's something weird. There's no such thing, okay? There's no such thing, okay? The Lord used a called-out assembly. Called out assembly. So I have uh, a lot of people uh, may have seen me from my travels or other preachers that I promoted. Or uh, we send them to Bible-believing churches and pastors to help because we're all a team. We're a called out assembly. I'm not a one-man show. So there are people who criticize me about, you mention Ruckman a lot. You know, what's, what's the matter with you? Why do you mention Ruckman a lot? Well, because the Lord used him to change my life. I mean, if there's a church member that I have in my church who mentions me a lot, maybe I won't like it, but that means something to that church member. Amen. Pastor Kim led me to Christ. Pastor Kim helped me grow in the Lord. Well, you know, I'm going to follow Pastor Kim uh, with his church because the Lord used him on that one. And then here's some pious so-and-so. Well, I thought Jesus Christ is your role model, not Gene Kim. Shut up, man. You're following yourself when you say, Jesus Christ, I follow Jesus Christ. I know what that means. That means you have no one you follow except your distorted fantasy of how you picture Jesus telling you to do something. Beware of that when you're, okay? A lot of you who watch online, you see that. That's 99% of the things that you watch. So watch out for that. I'm telling you, okay? So number three, beware of this abuse about outside the camp where you go rogue. That's pride there. That's a lot of pride.
But there's a pride in this too, favorite preacher club, right? So, I mean, if you get onto some of these independent fundamental Baptist churches, they get into Hiles, Hiles, Hiles so much. I mean, they'll, they'll do a standing ovation for like 10 minutes, nonstop clapping when Jack Hiles gets up. It's just, it's just ridiculous, you know. I think you all should do better and then just clap longer whenever I get up over here so my feelings are just so hurt, you know. So. <laughs> but see, there's that, uh, what's that? That's all that pride. You know what all three have in common? Pride. If you're humble, you're not going to get into any of these three. Okay. Now let's go to verse 14. Verse 14. For here have we no continuing city. Ain't that the truth? So Paul is saying in this place, in this world, we have no earthly city that we can continue to reside in or live in. That's right. This world is not our home. We're, we're sojourners. We're pilgrims here. You might recall in Hebrews 11, I talked about that, right? This city, this earthly city is not our home. We're just wandering. We're just passing through. But we seek one to come. However, we're seeking one that is coming for us. And the one that is coming for us, say believers, is heaven. So we have to be heavenly minded. So that's our city that we're looking up at. So our city is the heavenly city. Now, the heavenly city, the one that's coming for the Hebrews here in the tribulation context would be referring to, obviously, that you do know the millennial kingdom, the millennial kingdom. So that's the city that they're looking for to, uh, to come in their case. Now that I've explained the two applications of the tribulation saint and the Christian in verse 14, we got to rewind from verse 1 through 13, right? We got to rewind from verse 1 through 13. Now 1 through 13, I've already put it in a church age context, right? Now why did I start out that way? The reason why is because what you want to make note on is Hebrews chapter 13 is the evidence why we know the author is Paul. Yeah. I've explained a little bit in the introduction in Hebrews, but now that we're in chapter 13, you'll notice the manner of writing is very different from chapters 1 through 12. And the challenge that I want to give is, if you read he the, last, uh, the last chapter of Hebrews, See how that matches with the last chapter of a lot of Pauline epistles. Right. You'll notice the brevity. You'll notice how he's wrapping things up, the salutations to people, and then certain wordings and tone is very Pauline, Paul. So because of that, Dr. Ruckman, he puts Hebrews chapter 13 as a Christian doctrinal application here. He prioritized so much on chapter 1 through 12 for a tribulation uh, application for the doctrine. But in chapter 13, he switched it to Christian. Why? Because it matches with all the other Christian epistles from Paul's writings. So the doctrinal application changed here in chapter 13 to Christian. Now, if you recall, I may have mentioned it in our beginning of Hebrews 13, uh, Hebrew study, the reason why there's this double application approach is because Paul was writing the book of Hebrews to Hebrews, and he was talking about end times. During the early times of the apostles, they were ministering to Jews first, not Gentiles. Paul, even at his beginning, he was not ministering to Gentiles. Actually, he even <coughs> had several years of doing Jews before he ministered to Gentiles. I don't know if you knew that. So he had several years, so that's enough time. So he had several years. He knows a lot of Jewish doctrine. Now there's no doubt about that. He probably knew more than the apostles. So he knew a lot of Jewish doctrines. So the apostles' ministry during that time was focusing on the nation of Israel, waiting for their millennial kingdom their Messiah to return, anticipating the tribulation to happen any moment. All right? I've already covered all of that. But you know what happened? What happened was the Jews rejected their Messiah, so then they had to turn to the Gentiles. 
So the Messianic kingdom the, for the millennium, the tribulation was postponed. That's the reason why, because it switched to Gentiles, we're now under the church age. So the tribulation and millenniums postponed until the church age is over. Romans 11 showed you that Paul said, once God is done with the Gentiles, he'll go back to the Jews. And he did say, when he goes back to the Jews, that is the millennial restoration of the nation of Israel that they've all been waiting for, okay? So Paul even said that at Romans 11. So that's the reason why Hebrews is, is titled literally Hebrews and his tribulation doctrine. But why is it at the last chapter it's Christian, right? And why is it that sometimes you can find Christian doctrine in the middle of Hebrews, just little nippets here and there? Because during that same time, God was gradually showing Paul church age doctrine. Remember, Paul said that he was given the church age doctrine. It was revealed to him unlike any other apostle. Not even Peter, James, John, those guys had it. So they didn't have it. Paul had it. So because Paul was being gradually introduced to that, he was thinking about a Jewish ministry that time. So he was giving Jewish ministry, but some things of church age doctrine were being in place over there. What happened at the last chapter is what you could see, it's reaching to the latter part of his ministry. Yes. If you look at the last verses, he'll mention about Timothy, who was imprisoned, or Paul himself, who was imprisoned. That's what it shows in Hebrews 13. So it shows that he's reached the latter part of the ministry. That can explain the sudden change. The sudden change is that here's an epistle. Think about it. This is very rational okay, and very historical. Paul was ministering to Jews at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. He was. But what happened? God said, no, do Gentiles. So Paul had to put this on a hiatus, see? But this did not mean he could not minister to Jews. God said, you can minister to Jews, but that's the last priority. You got to do Gentiles first. Paul, he even tried to disobey God by going to Jerusalem, remember? Yeah. But then God shoved him back to Gentiles. When he's reaching near the end of his life, he has more of an opportunity now to reach Jews, see? So during that time, here's his Hebrew epistle that he put on a shelf all that time. Don't authors postpone their writings for a while too, sometimes? He gets to finish it off now. See that? So that can explain a lot, okay? So there are, but that's just one explanation. There are many explanations for this. It's very common. Another thing I want to add is this. It's very common for books of the Bible that there can be uh, multiple authors, not just one. So, for example, book, book of Deuteronomy. We all say that it's written by Moses. But it shows right there that Joshua added some things in there as well. So it is very possible later writers can add on to their material, to earlier material that was years ago. So there is time gaps, time jumps within the chapters. They're not all done within six months, okay? Especially, they didn't have computer that time. They didn't have text message where you could do like this, or AI to say it all for you, okay? They had a parchment and an ink that runs out, and they had to go like, you know how long that takes? Okay, it takes a long time. All right. So let me wrap it up with the tribulation doctrine. And uh, 15 was the one that I want to talk about, but we'll do that next week. It's a very good verse, very good verse. But let me wrap it up now. So in chapter 13, 1 through 14, let me explain it this way then for tribulation doctrine, okay? So this is Christian doctrine, what we can see primarily. But if we take it for granted that the book of Hebrews, Paul was... Remember, I mentioned about the three different uh, things that could have happened that the author had in mind why it, why it was written out with double application. If one of those authorial intentions is true, that Paul, he was writing it in a way where it would be a tribulation Jew, then he didn't know that what he was writing, even though it was tribulation Jew, that God saw it as that could be, that could actually be Christian church age doctrine or even both Paul. 
See? So because of that, I want to stick to the tribulation uh, interpretation as well. I don't want to ignore that because that could be very possible in the, author, on the, in the author's intention when he's writing. Okay, so if there's tribulation, if there's tribulation application in Hebrews 13, he could be arguing that at verse 1 and verse 2 that brotherly love is going to be important. Now, the book of John is filled with brotherly love, and you do know he talks about tribulation doctrine. Obviously, loving in the church is going to be more important during the tribulation more than ever before because they're going to undergo a time of persecution. Another interesting slip could be that angels might be in there in between. And the possibility is Revelation 14. The angel preaches an everlasting gospel to them. Another possibility is that because in the book of Revelation, it's filled with passages of angels coming down on the earth during the tribulation. So verse 2, where they might entertain angels unawares, they might be doing that by accident during the tribulation. Verse 3 is a no-brainer, is that uh, tribulation saints, they could undergo imprisonment. That matches well with Matthew chapter 25. At the end of the tribulation, they have brethren who are imprisoned for the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, by the Antichrist, he persecutes them. Then in uh, verse uh, 4, we see right here that uh, this is ref uh, he's talking about practical applications about marriage, Verse 5, practical applications about covetousness. So 4, 5, and 6, it can apply the same thing to tribulation as much to a Christian. Uh, the difference is, in our case, we know that our salvation is secure, so Jesus Christ will never leave us. In their case, as long as they hold fast to the end, remember, that was conditional in Hebrews. As long as they hold fast to the end, they have no reason to fear because Jesus Christ will be with them during their time. They know what they're doing is right. So that will be the context of 4, 5, and 6 about having confidence in Jesus not leaving them. The problem with Hebrews 13, 3, though, is being in the body, right? However, I mentioned about in the body in our previous Hebrew study, which was very interesting, that it was during a time of the transition of the book of Acts. So even though they were ministering to Jews and there was a lot of tribulation doctrine preached, the body of Christ started that time. So uh, the Jews, if you recall, I know this will be deep if you weren't there in our previous Hebrew study, but remember the Jews had a chance to have double programs. They could have been in the body of Christ while also having their national program in place. Both of them operations were underway. But they, because they rejected both programs, the Lord had to postpone the national program. And then the other program, which is the body program, uh, it's going to be up to them if they're going to receive it or not. But it became the churches now. Uh, if we go to verse uh, 7, uh, it's going to be pretty obvious that they're going to have to follow their uh, ministers well in the tribulation. So for people who say, I can survive in the tribulation, I'm going to fight the Antichrist, the government, but they don't have a pastor that they support or submit under or follow, then they're not going to survive the tribulation, okay? Don't, don't be mad at me. Just be mad at the verse, okay? So verse 8 says, Jesus Christ never changes. So the tribulation saint, they don't have to live in fear and doubt. They can trust Jesus who he is, so they don't have to get deceived by this false Jesus Christ, the Antichrist. So they're going to believe their Jesus, the God of the Bible, what he promised, and they're going to have to cling on to that, that he's not going to change. Uh, verse 9, it's going to be important, which is very interesting. Tribulation saints, they're going to know more meat doctrine than you and I. You know that? Because, we're already, because basically they cheated. Because we're already getting into more deep, deep, deep doctrine. All they have to do is just, oh, so-and-so already taught that, so now I got that and I can find out more, see? So uh, they'll know more meat doctrine than we do. However, even during that timeline, a practical application, which applies well to Christians as well. Don't be occupied in that, all right? You gotta occupy, you gotta establish with grace. 10 through 13, uh, 10 through 14 is going to be the same for them, is that the, those tribulation saints have to be outside, definitely, 
the Antichrist New World Order system. And during that time, they have to serve Christ, they have to sacrifice for him, they have to serve him as best as they could. So Hebrews 13, 12, sanctify blood, will match pretty well with Hebrews 10 then, see, with the verse that we looked at. Those tribulation saints, they have to uh, keep washing their garments in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to keep suffering for his name as they go outside the camp. If, if you can imagine yourself being a tribulation saint, it's easy, if you think it's easy to get bitter in your Christian service for God, imagine the tribulation saint who's starving to death and he's got kids and family to feed. So it's easy to get bitter. So he's going to have to keep saying, I have no right to even partake in that meat. See, so he's going to have to keep looking at that. And then verse 14, he's going to have, that Hebrew is going to have to seek for the city to come, uh, which is the heavenly city. But for us, when we say heavenly city, it's up in heaven. But for them, the heavenly city, you know what that means. That's the kingdom of heaven on the earth for their millennial, uh, during the millennial kingdom. Okay, then, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to our hearers and then opened our understanding and knowledge more of the scriptures and uh, help us to apply these things into our lives, into our heart, and please you. In Jesus' name we pray.